Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, this is actually my first KubeCon. Uh, done a little bit of workshop support in ancillary events uh, in past, but this is the first time actually attending a KubeCon, and I'm super excited. Um, so I'm not going to talk for five minutes about myself. Um, just so you know where I'm coming from, software engineer, um, got into architecture after that, and then um, I've been, worked in defense and in hospitality. And for some reason, I always uh, try to get myself on whatever the project is that the company is betting the business on. <laughs> so that's where I seem to end up. Uh, that has led me into some interesting spaces, a lot of distributed systems. Um, so that got me into Apache Cassandra and Kubernetes, and then now putting them together. So that's kind of the genesis of how I, I got involved in this kind of thing. Um, so on the way over here, I was grabbing a snack. And I went outside um, to the coffee station, and I'm walking past a table, and I don't, I don't recognize anybody here, so maybe I'll be okay. Uh, so I feel, I'm walking past a table, and there's a group of folks, and they're like, hey, did you see that um, DataSax is going to be doing a talk about how to put a database in, in Kubernetes? And one, and one guy goes, why would you do that? <laughs> so, Oh, there is still skepticism out here around this. Now, you know, I'm in a world where um, I'm used to this, and I've already bought into it. Um, this is an article that I'm showing up here that a colleague of mine, Chris Bradford, wrote about his personal journey from uh, being very anti, you know, running uh, databases in containers, just even that idea, to how he kind of went through that progression of running um, databases on Kubernetes. So. Uh, what I thought I would do is, this is not the why you should run a database in Kubernetes talk. It's more of the assuming that you agree with the premise of doing it, how do we actually go about doing it? Um, that, that's kind of where I'm coming from. If you want to ask me questions about why at the end, let's do it. There's a whole community of people that are working on putting stateful workloads onto Kubernetes. It's the data on Kubernetes community. Uh, we had a great um, full day of sessions here on Tuesday. You can go and watch a lot of those sessions online. Um, I may have even stole a couple of my points that you'll see later in the talk from things I heard on Tuesday. So I'm an active and avid learner in this space as well. There's a whole community of innovators doing great things here. Uh, one of the things that I learned uh, recently is a survey that um, the DOK community commissioned, um, talking to a lot of developers, architects, CIOs, you know, all, kind of all range of the, the IT workforce, looking at uh, who is adopting Kubernetes for stateful workloads. And it's kind of encouraging and a little bit surprising, these numbers that, that were uh, that we're able to come through. Now, who knows, is there confirmation bias from people who are willing to fill out a survey about data on Kubernetes? Yeah, maybe, okay. But look at this. Okay, so 70% of uh, people have at least some, that are using Kubernetes, have at least some stateful workloads there. 90% think that Kubernetes is ready for it, which to me says you're at least thinking about doing it. So how do we get there? Uh, I want to be clear and you know, set expectations, and you probably saw this when you were looking for sessions. This is an introductory level session. So I'm hitting the wave caps, and what I want to present to you is a way of thinking about how you put databases and possibly other stateful workloads onto Kubernetes. So I've tried to break it down uh, into a few simple steps, and it starts with making sure that you understand the Kubernetes primitives uh, for stateful data including the persistent volume subsystem. You want to uh, pick uh, a storage provider, because ultimately your data needs to end up somewhere, unless you're just doing caching. Uh, you need to pick a database, and then I'm going to highly recommend that you find an operator, assuming that you're using a, a pretty common or popular database. So those are the steps. Uh, what we'll begin with is making sure that we understand these Kubernetes primitives, uh, and especially the ones for managing state for stateful workloads, but actually we're going to look at some, uh, some of the other primitives as well that are not exclusively for managing state. They're all involved in putting a database on Kubernetes. So here we go. Uh, I want to start with uh, demystifying something. Now, when I was a junior developer, I 
was afraid of databases. Okay, database was like there was one guy on the team that knew how to interact with the database to be the DBA, create the tables and manage all of that. You wanted anything, you went to the guy. And this was a bad thing because Mitch got stuck there for a while. Like he got pigeonholed and he, was the only, he wanted to go and do other things, but he was the database guy. He was the only one that knew how to do it. So let's demystify. A database is an application. And applications, when we deploy them in Kubernetes or anywhere else, they're really an assemblage of compute, network, and storage. Those are their needs, right? It's code, it needs somewhere to run, it needs how to talk to other things, and it's gotta have some place to put its data. That fits a database just as well as uh, any other application. Okay, so let's look at what Kubernetes gives us and break it down, organize the Kubernetes primitives in terms of compute, network, and storage, okay? So we have these primitives, uh, for running pods on worker nodes. We have replica sets and deployments that we can use to run multiple copies of things. Uh, we have now stateful sets that Kubernetes gives, gives us to run stateful workloads. Um, for exposing our capabilities as services, we have a Kubernetes service. We have things like uh, Kubernetes ingress. So these are primitives that Kubernetes gives us for allowing things to find each other and talk to each other. Uh, and then in terms of storage, we have a whole persistent volume subsystem that uh, you know, we're definitely gonna focus on those. But in order to deploy a database, we just need to pick the right pieces from kind of this grab bag of resources that Kubernetes gives us. Um, I'm gonna show you some code here. There's gonna be some YAML. There will be YAML in this presentation. Um, this is all available on GitHub. Um, we have a repo uh, that uh, Patrick McFadden and I have created for a book that we're working on that, yes, I'll plug at the end. Of course, you know I will. Um, but that, that's where the material is being drawn from. And most of the images that you're going to see are also drawn from the book as well. Okay, so I want to talk about the persistent volume subsystem portion of Kubernetes. So our pods can mount volumes. Uh, and then the volumes can be of various types. Now, in production systems, what we see most commonly is the use of persistent volume claims. So that's a, a, a PVC mount is the most, most common type of volume that we see mounted uh, for an application that's doing something that's stateful. Okay, so the way that this breaks down is uh, I create my pod, I uh, create a persistent volume claim that's gonna uh, basically represent a request for storage that my pod has, uh, and then the um, Kubernetes is going to leverage a storage class, which is manage, managing a, a section of storage um, in order to create persistent volumes, and then when we create uh, pods and replica sets and uh, stateful sets, then that's when the process of creating those persistent volumes and associating with them with persistent volume claims happens. Um, generally, what we see is administrators being involved with configuring the storage classes, and developers are more concerned on that consumption side with creating persistent volume claims. So we'll talk through, this is kind of a big picture view, and we'll talk through some more of the details. So a persistent volume is the Kubernetes way of getting access to storage that outlives the lifecycle of a pod. And there are different types of persistent volumes. So we have local persistent volumes, and those are going to leverage storage that lives on your Kubernetes worker nodes. Uh, other persistent volumes uh, uh, types provide access to storage that is maybe outside the cluster, network storage. Maybe it's provided by your uh, preferred cloud that you're running on. Um, there are also third-party services. Maybe you are running in an on-prem situation and you actually have storage arrays that you're trying to allocate storage from. So all of these are legit uh, types of persistent volumes that you can use to provide storage to your application. And we'll talk a little bit more about selecting a storage provider in a bit. So this is an example of a persistent volume declaration. Uh, it references a volume size. It references allowed access modes, so you can have read only, read write, you can have volumes that can only be re, uh, written by a single writer at a time, the, these kinds of uh, parameters. 
Now, this particular definition is an example of a local volume that is mapped to a specific Kubernetes worker node using node affinity. And again, this is something that would typically be configured by someone who's responsible for, uh, for the administration of your Kubernetes cluster. So more on the ops side than the app dev side. Once a persistent volume has been made available for application use, uh, either manually or they can be dynamically created by storage classes, as we'll see. Uh, we can reference the persistent volume in our pod specifications through creating a persistent volume claim. And this provides a really good separation of concerns. This allows us to, as an app developer, just ask for the storage that we need and the characteristics that it should have without having to have the knowledge about the specific provider that's in use. This also makes our applications more easily portable so that they can run in a different environment as long as we, uh, the persistent volume claim can be satisfied by some persistent volume that's available in the target environment, then we should be good to go. There's also a second layer of separation. So uh, a persistent volume claim is actually defined externally to the pod that references it. So a persistent volume claim just represents, kind of in the abstract, a request for storage. Uh, so on the left side, we see the definition of a PVC. It includes a desired amount of storage and access mode, um, as similar to what we saw before with persistent volumes. Um, it can optionally specify a desired storage class. And that's uh, in the case where you actually would like or are OK with your persistent volume claim being satisfied dynamically by the storage provider provisioning more storage on your behalf. Uh, so on the right side, you see a pod that has been defined to reference that particular PVC. So pods linked to PVCs, which link to persistent volumes, which are created by storage classes. All right, so speaking of storage classes, uh, this is where the idea of picking a provider comes into play. So we understand the Kubernetes primitives at this point. Now we're ready to take what we've learned and assemble things to deploy applications. OK, so uh, storage class is responsible for the dynamic provisioning of storage on persistent volumes in order to help satisfy our PVCs. So the storage class handles the details of interfacing with our requested provider or the provider that we've configured so that the um, requested amount of storage can be set aside. So there's actually uh, a ton of different storage providers. Um, I didn't, I, I did like sort of like an informal survey. Uh, I didn't count on my fingers or anything, but as I was going through the kind of the solution showcase, there are a lot of storage providers here at KubeCon. Um, this is a, a rich area of, you know, competition and innovation um, and, and so there's a lot of options that are available, and that's just even from third-party vendors. I'm not even counting the, the, what's available from uh, our standard cloud, public cloud providers. So uh, one of the things that's pretty cool is this little uh, tool recently discovered, uh, new to me, um, at the bottom of the slide here, the um, Kubester, which uh, is a tool that's going to allow you to see what storage classes are already available in your cluster and make sure that they are configured correctly. So that's a, that's a pretty fun way to educate yourself. Um, the example that I'm showing here of declaring a storage class is a really simple example of a free storage provider from you know, open source from Rancher Labs that basically just allows you to provision your, your desktop or laptop computer as a storage provider if you're just running Kubernetes on your desktop kind of for you know, local dev purposes. So I use this, I use this one all the time. Uh, if you want to peel back the covers a little bit, this is where I, for a one second, kind of stray into non-introductory material, but I, I think it's interesting. So uh, there is a specification called the container storage interface. It's actually not unique to Kubernetes or tied to Kubernetes, you can use uh, CSI compliant storage providers on other uh, container orchestration platforms as well. But uh, this provides a specification and basically an API for providing cloud native storage. And most of these CS pro CSI providers, um, not necessarily all, but most of them actually uh, implement their control plane on Kubernetes. So I think it's really cool that 
you know, you can have your storage actually managed on the Kubernetes platform. Uh, and so anyway, I, I love geeking out, pe peeking under the covers for just a second. Okay, so now that we know about the primitives that we have and uh, the, the storage providers that we have available to us, so we, we pick a storage provider, now we're gonna pick a database. Um, and I'm gonna give you two options here of different deployments for databases. Uh, we're gonna look at a single node deployment of MySQL. Now, I understand that multi-node deployments of MySQL are possible, so don't get upset with me. Uh, I know that there is Vitesse, which helps you to do all of that, and there are other, and other operators um, that help you to do that for uh, different, different types of relational databases. Uh, I'm just gonna do a sim simple one-node example here, uh, and then we'll look at a Cassandra deployment that is a multi-node deployment. And maybe compare and contrast and look at uh, using some of the different um, application compute primitives that we introduced earlier, namely replica sets and deployments and stateful sets. Okay, so here's a sample deployment of MySQL, uh, and this is based on an example that you can find in the Kubernetes documentation. Um, I've kind of forked it on our, uh, our repo that I shared with you uh, earlier, that, that data on Kate, Kate's um, book repo, uh, or uh, GitHub org, and uh, so very, you know, relatively minor modifications to that standard Kubernetes documentation example. Uh, what this does is deploy WordPress, a single node of WordPress on top of a single node of MySQL. Uh, and one thing that's, that's kind of interesting around this example is that it shows not only MySQL uh, creating a PVC and getting some storage allocated to it, but then also WordPress is using MySQL and also on top of that getting its own volume where it wants to store some configuration data. So uh, it's a good demonstration of the idea that um, applications can use databases which use persistent volumes and applications can also assign volume or uh, acquire volumes directly themselves. So because we are only deploying a single node of MySQL in this example, uh, a Kubernetes deployment is a good choice. Now, uh, a, a deployment is a compute construct that is going to uh, sit on top of replica sets. Uh, so deployments manage the life cycle of replica sets, which in turn create pods according to a, a number of replicas that we request. So uh, this is better than just running a database in a bare pod by itself because when you create it as part of a deployment, Kubernetes is going to take on responsibility for that life cycle for making sure that your desired number of replicas, in this case one, is running. So we're going to this, this might not be uh, high, super high availability because we could have some downtime if a pod dies and has to be recreated. We're, we're down from a database perspective during that restart period, but it is gonna give us some measure of availability. Uh, the other thing that's curious to note here is you see on this slide that there's two replicas that are created by this replica set. They're both pointing to the same PVC. So this is a, a characteristic of these replica sets is that there's only one PVC that is defined in the replica set. If you create multiple replicas, they're all pointing to that one PVC. Now this is a great, config, this is a, a great configuration if you have read-only data. You could certainly get some efficiencies out of this. Uh, but if you wanna actually have a, a situation with multiple nodes that you're writing to, like Cassandra, which we'll see later, uh, this wouldn't be an appropriate configuration for you and you would wanna use something other than the deployments and replica sets. Okay, so to deploy our single MySQL node, there's a couple of things that we need to create to start out. Um, the first thing is on the left there is you see security credentials. Now, one of the things I love about working with Kubernetes is that things are secure by default, right? You, you can't get out of port unless you expose it. So, we wanna apply these same principles when we're talking about databases. So the MySQL that we're deploying uh, has a, an administrator, username, and password. We can actually control what that is by defining it in a secret, which we will then pass into, uh, uh, you know, leverage in the definition of our deployment um, for MySQL. On the right side, we see uh, the definition of the PVC that's going to be referenced by our replica set. Okay, so these are two ingredients that we create up front. Now we are ready to 
specify the YAML for our deployment for MySQL. Okay, so in, in, again, we're not creating an individual pod, we're creating a deployment that wraps it. And so part of this definition is not the actual pod, but a template for a pod. So every time the uh, deployment is going to create an additional pod, it's going to use this template or kind of the recipe for creating that pod. Um, and again, you see in there the reference to the single PVC that we declared earlier. All right, the next piece that uh, we're gonna talk about is how do you actually make a database accessible to your applications? Again, it would kind of be lame to address our applications to a single pod instance, a kind of a hard-coded instance or IP address because that pod could die and get restarted. So we wanna stick a Kubernetes service in front of that. And this is gonna abstract the details of where uh, that database instance is actually living on the network. So even if we're only running a single pod, this is still useful. Uh, we have different types of services that are defined in the Kubernetes world. So you have a cluster IP service, which is only within the scope of that cluster. Uh, you can use load balancers, um, and those are services typically you, uh, typically, an uh, implementation of a load balancer is tied to your cloud provider. So incoming calls might be round robin to different instances behind that service. You might find that useful. Um, we have other things uh, like uh, external ports. We have uh, ingress that can be defined. And what we see most often, if we're talking about a database tier, is the use of a cluster IP service or maybe a load balancer. That's, that's what I tend to see most often. Usually you have an application that's sitting on top of your database and the application is what is providing um, an interface outside of Kubernetes. So not that you couldn't expose the database directly, but um, just don't see that very often. So this is an example of a simple cluster IP service. This is what is known as a headless service. Um, so what this does is uh, when you do the DNS lookup based on this name of a WordPress MySQL service, what you would get back is the IP addresses of everything that's sitting underneath it. And again, in this case, it's just a single IP address. Uh, so headless service is a great way to go uh, to put in front of your database instance. All right. So. Um, that was a quick fly through of a MySQL deployment example. Again, I, I want to refer you to um, the GitHub repo in the book if you want kind of the more blow by blow detailed description. Um, we try to go through all the, the various uh, options kind of at a high level and then refer you to the, the points in the Kubernetes documentation where you can deep dive and get the lower level details. So just hitting the wave caps for you right now. Um, we want to talk about deployment of Cassandra now. So, the way that Cassandra works is um, it, it's a, it's a multi-node architecture. Uh, no one runs one node of Cassandra in production. Um, not very many people run three nodes of Cassandra in production. Generally, you, you have a lot of data if you're using Cassandra, and those are organized in, uh, there's two different ways to think about how Cassandra organizes itself and the data that it's storing. So there's two viewpoints on this slide. They both refer to the same cluster. One of them is a kind of a more physical layout in terms of where the machines are located within your network. So a lot of times you'll have multiple data centers, what Cassandra calls a data center, and multiple racks. So in cloud deployments, most people map um, a Cassandra data center to a cloud provider region, and they map a rack to uh, a particular availability zone. So that's what you'll see in the, if you look at the code details of the example. Uh, so Cassandra is aware of where you are placing this nodes because you, you tell it where the nodes are in terms of the network topology, and then it's going to try to store multiple copies of your data so that they are distributed across the different availability zones and even regions if you have a multi-region cluster. So those are kind of the two viewpoints of the world. Um, Cassandra uses something called partitioning, which is similar to the concept of sharding, but it's managed entirely by Cassandra, so you're never... Uh, interacting with what, what that kind of sharding our algorithm looks like when you're using Cassandra. So I wanted to give you those details about the topology so that this slide would make sense if you have some familiarity with stateful sets. Um, the way that what's shown here is a Cassandra deployment uh, that has three racks. So one data center consisting of three racks and there's a single pod that's shown here. 
uh, in each rack. And so we have a, a stateful set that is managing each of the racks. Uh, and then as you can see here, there's a, there's a key difference from the MySQL example uh, that we saw before in that each pod is actually getting its own persistent volume claim. So this means each Cassandra node has its own dedicated storage, um, and, and that's what we want. Okay, so we'll talk up front here uh, about the idea of creating these uh, standards, uh, a, a service that is pretty much like the, my, the service that we put in front of MySQL. It's very, very similar. And this time we're exposing the standard Cassandra port of 9042. And I'm, I'm showing it to you now because we're actually gonna reference it on this next slide. So this is probably our most complicated, complicated YAML that we're gonna see. So uh, trigger warning uh, for anyone who doesn't like reading YAML on slides, possibly including me, but uh, this is better than me um, scrolling through a terminal window and screwing it up. So, uh, this is a, a, the definition of a stateful set for, uh, for a Cassandra cluster. It's gonna span a couple slides. We'll just walk through it a little at a time and I'll try to, to guide you through. So the left side, we see the name of the stateful set um, and we're gonna reference that service that we just created. So we're telling Kubernetes that, we, that that is the service that we wanna put in front of our nodes. Uh, also on this left side, we're looking at, we're, we're defining uh, which policies we want Kubernetes to use. There are some options for how it manages the life cycle of the pods as it, as it spins them up and down to scale up and, and destroys pods in order to scale down in the stateful set. So the options that I've specified here are actually the defaults and they represent a more conservative approach to, uh, to managing the stateful set in that um, they're gonna start one node at a time, and they're gonna wait for each node to, to report that it's ready before starting to spin up the next node. And the, the restart policy that's here um, is, it functions in a similar way. So restarting a single node at a time. Uh, when you, so the, the uh, stateful set does support the idea of a rolling update. So you can deploy updates to the, to the stateful set that will be rolled out individually to the pods. Um, there's other things that we see here on the right side of the slide, uh, exposing ports for the different interfaces that Cassandra has uh, for client access with, this, with CQL, Cassandra Query Language, uh, management APIs, uh, interfaces for talking to other nodes, and so on. And the last little thing on the bottom right there is, is kind of cool, defining a pre-stop command. This helps us uh, ha have each Cassandra node be a good citizen. Uh, in, instead of just ghosting the rest of the cluster, uh, when, we, when we scale down the cluster, it's gonna actually communicate and offload its data nicely to other nodes within the cluster. So um, there are other hooks that we can define uh, in terms of, we can, we can customize the liveness and readiness probes that are used on each node, um, as well as this pre-stop that you see here. Okay, we're halfway through the YAML. All right, so, uh, what we see here on the left side is overriding some environment variables. Um, the particular Cassandra image that we're using in this example actually allows configuration by providing a YAML file, which you can swap in uh, and override Cassandra's built-in YAML configuration. Or you know, there's also several environment variables that are supported that you can kind of override the, the location of various things and, and some different properties. Um, and then finally, we need storage. So we're gonna define a, a PVC template, and every time the stateful set is gonna stamp out a new pod, it's gonna, going to uh, create a new, a new PVC according to the template that we have defined here. And this functions much the same way as the other PVC definitions that you've seen in the previous slides. So uh, that's, that's the great thing about stateful sets is that it's going to manage the uh, the creation of these pods and the creation of the storage that they need at the same time. Um, one of the things that they do not do is when you scale down a cluster and uh, nodes are eliminated from the stateful set, it does not de automatically delete the PVCs for you. So you're welcome, your data is still there even when the cluster scales down, you actually have to go and explicitly delete, delete those PVCs in order to free the data. All right, so stateful sets are, are pretty powerful. 
And you can see that uh, a simple example can involve quite a bit of YAML configuration. So you might ask, do you, is, that, you know, is that too complicated? Do I want to manage that complexity? Uh, you may or may not. So, and that's just, all I've shown you here is uh, some brief talk about you know, initial deployment of the database, and then maybe a little bit we've talked about scaling up and scaling down or kind of hinted at that. Now, what about things that databases need? Care and feeding, tuning, uh, you know, debugging things, uh, long, you know, identifying long-running queries. There's all kinds of things that go into the operations of a database that, that we need on top of that initial deployment. So this is where the idea of operators comes in. Uh, so this is a great quote uh, from Tuesday. This is very likely a paraphrase of what was actually said, but I remember Rick Vasquez uh, from Western Digital saying something like this in a great panel discussion that was part of that DOK day. And his, his words of wisdom were basically, yeah, if you're, you know, deploy, if you're gonna deploy a database in Kubernetes, you should use an operator. And that was like a word to everyone, not, not, you know, not just noobs or you know, uh, pe people that maybe have less experience doing this. Basically, like, you should be using an operator. That's really gonna save you a lot of pain. Um, and I would concur with that opinion. Okay, so this is where the operator pattern comes into play. This is a Kubernetes native way of managing applications that take advantage of the Kubernetes deploy, uh, the, the Kubernetes control loop. Um, so there's very likely uh, an operator available for the database that you're using. Um, and, and in particular, in the Cassandra world, we had like five or six of them. As of a, uh, uh, earlier this year, we've kind of reconciled as a community down to one called CAS operator. And you can find it uh, at the address shown on there. Um, and then we've actually kind of broadened beyond that. So CAS operator manages the provision and running of your nodes, but you also need other things. And this is a common thing for other databases as well. You need to manage backup and restores. Maybe you need secure provisioning of keys or different access credentials. Um, there's a lot of things that go into it, right? So an example of something innovative that we're doing in the Cassandra community is this Kate Sander project in which we're actually building an ecosystem of things around the core Cassandra project. Uh, it includes CAS operator to run Cassandra, but then also tools called Medusa and Reaper that perform operational tasks, including backup and restore capabilities. Uh, we've integrated the Kube Prometheus stack so that we have metrics reporting. You can, you can use the Kube Prometheus stack that comes with Kate Sandra, or you can swap in your own instances if you would like. Uh, and then on top of that, we've put Stargate, which is an, uh, basically an API layer that we've built on top of Cassandra. And uh, you know, my, this is not a plug for our, our database as a service, but we have Astra, our database as a service. What we're basically doing with that is a lot of the technology that, that runs that goes into Stargate and the Kate Sander projects. So when people ask, are you, you know, can you run a database on Kubernetes? Well, I mean, that's what we're doing. We have a whole, database as a service business that is running in Kubernetes. Um, so if you want to hear more about this kind of stuff, there's a talk that um, my colleague Chris Bradford is, is co-presenting with Ty from Google this afternoon. I recommend uh, checking that talk out, especially if you want to talk about multi-cluster, going, having a database that spans multiple Kubernetes clusters. This is a really interesting and innovative area, and there's a lot of work going on here. Uh, this is the book plug that I promised that you, I know that you really wanted to see. Um, the first three chapters are out and uh, available. If you have an O'Reilly account, you can see them on the learning platform. And I'm really grateful to uh, Portworks who have agreed to sponsor the book. And you can actually get the first three chapters for free. That's what the first three that are available uh, from them right now. They've been handing out cards and I'm giving you an address here that you can use. Um, this is something that uh, I don't. We're not the world class experts. Like no one, there is no one that has all of the knowledge. So I am really happy to be corrected and <laughs> fault to be found with things that we have written and things that can be made better. So I'd love to have feedback um, from people that are looking at the early release of the book. And I'm going to go hang out at the Data Stacks booth after this. Um, we are giving away a, a video game machine. Um, 
but I know that you're not all about the swag and the prizes. So I know that you want to hear my colleague Rags come and give some demos. He's going to be doing some hands-on stuff with Kate Sandra at the booth. And I think he also has a couple of t-shirts to give away um, if we have folks to, that want to ask questions. And I'm sorry, virtual people. I cannot send you a virtual t-shirt. OK, so I'm, I'm ready for questions if we have time. You know, I think we might be out. But okay. um, yeah, thank you very much, Jeffrey. All right, thank you. Thank you.